So we're going we're gonna to shift from uh, an organization that makes almost everything known to mankind in the electronics world in Samsung and to another effort that's very much focused on the high performance uh, computing space and, and in supercomputers. And uh, you know, m many of you might not know about this, but uh, I actually have a, a connection to this topic uh, in that uh, my grandfather was one of the, I grew up in Minnesota, and my grandfather was one of the founders of one of the first supercomputer companies, Cray Research. Uh, this was back in the, the 70s. A bunch of guys from Control Data at the time went and started with Seymour Cray, Cray Research, and my grandfather was one of those folks. And I think he would be very interested to hear from our next uh, speaker, Andreas Olsson, who's the founder and CEO of Adaptiva. Uh, he has started a Kickstarter campaign to essentially fund a $99 supercomputer. Uh, and I'm sure that back when my grandfather at Cray was selling uh, Cray machines, they were a little more expensive than $99, <laughs> even adjusted for inflation. Um, but I just, uh, I, I love this. Yeah, Andreas is going to talk today about the Parallela, which was inspired by Raspberry Pi uh, and uh, is really looking at doing a $99 supercomputer. So welcome, Andreas. We want to hear all about it. So, thank you. Um, so, uh, I'm going to be talking today about what we're doing at Adaptiva and this new project, Parallela. Um, let's see, what this guy? Um, and uh, I love the fact that we're following Samsung, one, you know, the largest electronics company in the world. We are the smallest electronics company in the world, maybe. Um, one third of the engineering team is standing right here, right now. <laughs> And, uh, and somehow, despite being so small, we actually managed to tape out a 64-core, uh, 28-nanometer chip that works and uh, burns 2 watts uh, at 100 gigaflops. So that makes us the most efficient microprocessor company in the world. Uh, now, now, we did that two years ago and uh, you know, went around the world and tried to pitch this thing. And uh, it was you know, like crickets. Uh, the world wasn't ready yet. Um, so that's where the Kickstarter project comes in. Uh, we're now becoming more of a system company because we realize that you know, people want computers. They don't want chips. Um, so, uh, so this is something that uh, um, I think most people in here get. Not everybody out there gets it. And it's the fact that we have a, a huge problem right now and in terms of energy efficiency. And we're going along, and you have Moore's Law, kind of doubling of compute every two years. and uh, Energy efficiency hasn't kept up. So now you see a bigger, bigger energy, you know, battery problem or bigger, bigger electrical consumption problem in data centers. And the pain point just quite isn't there yet, um, So which is why most people don't care. They're going along their business. And, and I mean, coding is hard, so you figure, you know, push that off until another day. But the problem is, is, is getting worse and worse. So looking at 2020, 2025, you know, what are we going to do? So we have to start thinking differently. Um, so this is probably the kind of architecture everybody wants that nobody's had for very, very, very many years. Uh, you know, you want, a, you want a CPU that's easy to use, single-threaded, infinite bandwidth to memory, and infinite memory, right? Um, the real world is a, is a lot more complex than that. Uh, you know, we started off with, uh, you know, low-frequency <coughs> processors with lots of bandwidth to, to off-chip. Uh, then we scaled up the frequency. Then we hit the ceiling. All right, so we ran out of performance there. Um, then we maybe did multi-issue. Um, to increase the performance, because let's face it, everybody always needs more performance. Um, now that wasn't enough, so now you add SIMD. Um, maybe you have four, uh, four wide vectors, like a, an SSE or an Altivec or a, a Neon instruction set, um, but that isn't enough, because programmers still need more performance, so now you do multi-core. So you put four cores down, and uh, now what? Now we're kind of started running out of tricks here. Uh, we're burning a lot of power, uh, we're starting to saturate our performance because the programming model isn't really suited for, for that kind of multi-core. So we've seen this in the desktop. We've seen this in servers. Um, in mobile, we're seeing it as we speak. We're running out of tricks. So uh, you know, wh wh what can we do here? Um, and um, so we, you know, from 2008, since I started the company, um, kind of looking at what, the, what are the fundamental chip design trends that are going to um, 
shape the future of computing. Um, I mean, power consumption, um, there's no doubt that that's important. Memory bottleneck is a huge thing. Um, frequency wall, we're, we're done there. Wiring is more of a technical issue on the chip design thing, uh, uh, chip design front, but it's incredibly uh, challenging. Thermal density is, now we're talking about laws of physics. Latency wall, same thing, laws of physics. Uh, yield issues, we can no longer expect our processes to be perfect like they were at maybe, uh, you know, five, ten years ago. Things will fail. How do we design around that on the chip and software side of things? Uh, time to market, you know, it's got to be high level abstraction to stay productive. Um, and software complexity, we're talking about millions of lines of code, how do we deal with that? And uh, of course, Amdahl's law, right? How do you actually get the speed up that you want from parallel software? So all those t 10 things should drive the future of computing, right? So that, that's kind of now setting up how we, how we, uh, how we go forward. Um, but we don't have to go that far. I mean, if we look at uh, kind of one of our inspiring computers, which is uh, every time you look at it, you go, wow, this is, you know, the stuff we're doing today is so primitive compared to what's already out there and what's already been invented in nature. Um, so, you know, the brain, right? It's, it's parallel. Um, it's low power, 30 watts with, uh, you know, billions of, uh, of neurons. Um, it's heterogeneous, um, which means that, you know, different parts of the brain are specialized to do different functions. Uh, and it's robust. I mean, if you lose part of, you know, a small part of your brain, the brain doesn't shut down, which is very different from most computers today. If you get one transistor in the wrong place, you're done. One bit error in the wrong place, you're done, right? You get a crash. That's kind of ridiculous going forward. Um, so so the, the practical vision for today is heterogeneous computing, um, which is, you know, let's use the tools that we have today and let's put together a system that's more, uh, more efficient than what one thing can do, right? There's no magical all-you-can-do tool. Um, and, and, you know, so this is, these are some of the things that we have now in our toolbox. You have the big CPUs, x86, ARMs, that are, you know, have so much legacy in them, they're not going away anytime soon. Uh, but they're probably, you're not, probably not going to see a, a thousand ARM cores or a thousand x86 cores on a chip. Um, I don't think that's going to be efficient. Um, you have a FPGA logic that you can make do anything, right? Let's say you want a, an encryption engine or a video decode engine, you could implement that in FPGA, and you can actually reconfigure it on the fly. A GPU, incredibly good at graphics, it's kind of a specialized engine for graphics that's not starting to do some compute as well. Um, analog, we haven't seen a lot of that, but it's going to come. Um, and then you have the, the, the lower right part, which is what we focused on, coming up with this kind of asymmetric processing where maybe you have an ARM or an x86 that does the bulk of the application processor, but you know, why not have hundreds or not thousands of small RISC CPUs that are tuned for one thing, and it could be floating point code processing or, or, or something like that. Um, so, now the current state of, of parallel programming is that, uh, you know, people like abstraction. You know, it used to be you program punch cards, and then it was assembly, and then it was, you know, C, and then it was uh, C++ and Java, and, you know, you, you get these frameworks built up because you need to be productive, you need to get the job done. And today we are at an incredibly high level of abstraction, most of us, uh, but parallel program is not there yet. Uh, so, you, you know, today parallel program is, is, is quite fringe. You know, there are very, very few people who do it. Um, I, I know some incredibly talented programmers who program, you know, single thread type programming for, you know, in, in kind of uh, um, 10, 20 years. And, and, you know, parallel programming for them and parallel debugging for them is hard. Right? So imagine a freshman in college that you're going to tell him, look, if you want good performance, you have to be a parallel programmer. What is he going to do if a, a guy with 10 to 20 years of experience is having a hard time? So, um, so I think the, the, the challenge today is, you know, how do we make it so that Parallel programming is as productive as Java or Python is today. That should be the goal, and not the way it is today, where uh, a few coding ninjas coding in, you know, OpenCL or CUDA or Erlang or Haskell or whatever it is, they can make the parallel hardware really sing. But most folks, they need a, a library function. You know, it, it should really get to the point where there's, you know, thousands of projects on GitHub all written in parallel code, running on any type of hardware. Um, so the challenges are, are immense going forward if we really want to change the way we program and change the way we build the computers. We're going to have to rebuild the whole computer ecosystem, uh, rewrite billions of lines of code, uh, re-educate every single programmer to become a parallel programming, and of course start teaching parallel programming in, in kind of freshman year of college or maybe high school. Uh, I mean, certainly a lot of high schools in the U.S., they're teaching Java or I think C in, in, in high school, and 
why not teach true parallel programming in high school? Um, it's a lot easier to teach somebody than to reach teach sometimes. Um, so um, now, <laughs> I, you know, I think this is a hard slide, but, um, but if you look at the bigger scope of things, to me at least there's no question at all that the future of computing is parallel. I mean, it, it just how else are we going to scale, right? We're, we're, we're on such an exponential curve in terms of performance. You know, and I, as I showed, we were kind of running out of tricks, right? How are we, where are we going to get the next million X speed up from? It only, only can come from parallel. So, um, you know, and then, you know, if it's only going to come from parallel, and when, if that's going to be in 2020, 2050, or 2100, you know, why wait? We, you know, we can go parallel right now. Um, but it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to hurt before we get there. And that's where we started this parallel project, right? Was our, we've been trying to sell parallel computing for, um, for five years, and uh, the market wasn't ready for it. So this is kind of our attempt at creating a market and doing something good at the same time. You know, they, they can go hand in hand. So we launched this $99 parallel computing platform um, called Parallela. And, and that's what the rest of the talk is going to be about. Um, so. Um, now, I was inspired by, by some of the things that Jim said earlier, which uh, about you know, the Linux Foundation and, and some of the principles of that by which people work. Um, one of the key things in launching this project that we realized is that the only way to make it work and to, to leverage a huge community is to make it open and completely open. And to a hardware guy, that's, that's scary, right? I mean, a software bug, you have a software bug, somebody is... Um, uh, gives you feedback, right? Uh, and tell you you have a bug here, you go fix it in a day, and now you're good again. If you find a bug in, in, in hardware, it could be 18 months until you fix it. And then, you know, <laughs> for 18 months you have to walk around with that mark that says, look, you <laughs> designed crappy hardware, right? That's no good. Uh, you can't fix it. So, uh, so it's, it's incredibly scary from a hardware standpoint. Um, and that's why, uh, uh, you know, open sourcing the, um, the drivers, the SDK, uh, opening up the documentation um, was, was a big step for us. Um, but it, now that we've done it, it's, it's so much more fun. Uh, it's just, I mean, it's easy to collaborate with people. It's easy to talk to people. We get a lot of great feedback. Um, and so it was, for us, it was, it was a really, really great thing. Um, and, um, and finally, you know, um, a platform should be accessible, right? Which means it needs to be cheap and it needs to be fairly easy to use, hopefully. Uh, and the, and the, I mean, if you look at the Raspberry Pi, one of our, the projects that inspired us, you know, this is kind of $25, $35 computer. Um, they've sold a million of them in a year. Um, you kind of see what, the, what happens if you provide something that's cheap enough that people can afford. You know, I, I wish we could sell a million of these things. It would be great. I don't think we will. If we can sell 10,000, fantastic, right? Uh, and um, uh, if we can sell 10,000 to the right people and then take it and innovate with it, We've, we've done our work, you know, we've done, we've done a good thing. Um, so we launched this project in the fall, um, and the idea was it's going to be a, a $99 Linux supercomputer, and uh, supercomputer is a relative term. This supercomputer, you know, in 1992, I think the connection machine was about 100 gigaflops, it cost $10 million. So that was 20 years ago. And, uh, and today, 100 gigaflops, actually it's not 99, it's 199, but it's on the same ballpark. Um, and, um, um, so, yeah, so we launched this thing. Uh, the goal was to raise $750,000. Uh, it, uh, it, it, was, it was a fun 30 days, ex incredibly exhausting. Um, um, we hadn't designed the board yet. Um, we had lots of hurdles on the way, but in the end of the day, we made it. We raised the money, and then for the last six months, we've been sweating trying to deliver on those process, uh, promises. Um, but if we look at some of the people who backed us, uh, absolutely have some of the smartest programmers on the planet, are now, you know, excited about this project. Um, now it's up to us to deliver hardware that they can use. But we're confident that once we deliver the hardware, people are going to do some amazing things here. Um, and when you think about it, uh, the goal here was basically a five-watt computer, right? Um, and uh, uh, that runs, uh, you know, 100 gigaflops. Um, what are you going to do with that? So, so th the feedback we already got was, uh, well, you know, what, what kind of products do people want to use it for? What, what's the next killer app? Um, Software-defined radio, we've already had people starting to code for it. Uh, people are looking at ray tracing, um, all kinds of image processing applications, robotics, gaming, cryptography, media servers, um, HPC. It's really all over the map, right? It's, you know, because a computer can be used anywhere. Um, 
So uh, in terms of the architecture, it's, uh, it's a dual core A9 that runs Linux. So uh, on our prototype platforms, we already run Ubuntu 1204, uh, taken from the, the uh, Linaro uh, platform. And uh, it's got you know, most of the peripherals that you would expect, USB, HDMI, Gigabit Ethernet. It's, it's a nice little computer, but with some twists, right? So the parallel part is not coming from there, and the heterogeneous part is not coming from there. There are lots of great um, dual core A9 um, platforms out there. There's probably 200 of them in this room based on you know, smartphones. So that, that was not what's going to make the difference. Um, what's going to make the difference is uh, this one has the FPGA logic built in, so which means that you can configure it to do anything, and, uh, and it's accessible. So if you know hardware design, you can go in there and design your own coprocessor um, to augment the A9, and we're going to see a lot more of that. And then finally, in the, uh, in the lower corner there, kind of what, what we bring to the table, this Epiphany coprocessor, um, which is a kind of a massively parallel CPU array that can also offload from the ARM. So now you have the system where you have all kinds of resources all contained within a single shared memory map um, that, you know, it's, you know, it's a canvas. It's, you know, you go, uh, go have fun. Um, so this is, uh, this is very exciting. So after six months, we, uh, we finally got the boards on Thursday. So, and I, I brought two of them to show. I'm not going to turn them on, but um, this is pretty cool, I think. So those are two. One is a 16-core board. That's a 64-core board in my, in my left hand. And uh, basically, we have two server-level performance computer boards, right? And uh, <laughs> they consume five watts each. Uh, and I think, you know, once we're, <laughs> we're just very excited to get these in the hands of the right people, because uh, it's, uh, it's going to be awesome. Uh, so, so what we have here um, is, um, and, and, and this is now, this, we, they came back on Thursday, right? So now, now the cool part. Um, so day one, bringing it up, incredibly scary. Um, this was the end of the day. Um, there were issues during the first day, nothing not fixable. Uh, we even have to get our, get, our, get our soldering iron and fix some things by, on our own after the contract manufacturer had gone home. Um, and... Uh, Turns out my soldering skills stink, and, uh, but, but I, didn't, I didn't break it. So day one, it was alive, right? The power supplies came up, the clocks were there, uh, you know, it came out of reset. So, so far, so good. Uh, day two, absolutely one of, the, one of my, the best days we've had in a long time. You know, we ran a program, right? That's, you know, it seems very trivial, right? Every, I mean, it would be much cooler if this was a, you know, kind of a, a rendering engine running and showing you something. Wow, but... To me, running, I'm a hardware guy, running Hello World, if I can do that, it's going to be okay. Uh, <laughs> at least for a while, until next step. So day three, uh, and we hadn't, we hadn't really talked to, the, uh, to, the, uh, to our chip yet, right? This was just running on the A9, but it was still, there's lots of things that have to go right to get that far. Day three, uh, now we could read and write to our core processor. And our core processor is so simple that once you can read and write to it, you can pretty much do anything. Um, and so that was day three. So, so far, so good. Uh, now, day four, day of rest, sort of. Uh, <laughs> uh, day five, I found out that today, uh, Roman, my collaborator, was able to run a bigger program out of DRAM. So now we have another checkbox that uh, uh, things are moving forward. So we're, we're, we're ramping this up. Hopefully soon we'll have something that can actually run Linux and uh, Ubuntu and, and, and so forth that can, we can show some extra really, really attractive demos. But the hardware is looking great. Um, which, you know, six months ago when we started this project, we said, yeah, we think we can, we can put all this stuff on a, on a credit card, and we think it should cost $100. Well, we know it should cost $100. We don't know if we can do it or not. Um, so it was six months of not knowing if we can even really deliver on this project. We were confident, but not 100%. And just seeing it working, and by, at this time, we kind of met our price point as well. Um, it's, um, it's, it's a good feeling. Um, so now we're, we're here. Now what's next? Uh, from here on, from the boards working, we have to ship over 6,000 of these to the Kickstarter backers. Um, those are kind of our early adopters. And uh, that's not an easy task. Now we're talking about logistics, manufacturing with quality. Uh, we obviously want everybody to be happy, because if people are not happy, that's going to be very bad for the, for the community. 
Um, the other thing we're going to start based on this, um, we're actually going to give away free kits to universities. Now, one of the beauties of making it cheap enough is, let's say it costs us $100 per kit, which means we can give away one to 100 universities. We spend $10,000 uh, out of our own pocket. Now, we're a very small company. We can't do a lot of that, but even 100 academic partners, $10,000 seems like a good idea. So we're going to do that. Um, next step is we have to build a sustainable distribution model. Again, with, a, with less than five people in the company. There are some things we can innovate with. Engineering is one of them. Logistics, not so much, right? Um, answering emails and, and, and keeping track of shipping addresses is, is, can be a nightmare when you have 6,000 people. When you have 100,000, you're just done. So next time is, um, is a, a supply model. Um, and then finally, you know, start working on, on massive parallelism, right? So the architecture we have uh, scales fairly well to, uh, to, to large array sizes. We could actually put 1,000 cores on a chip tomorrow if you wanted to, if somebody wanted it. Um, so, so we'll keep working on that. And, uh, but the, the, the really good news is that we have, we have boards working. And uh, we're, kind of, uh, we're a little bit running a little bit late. Um, but we're going to ship them this summer. So, All right. <laughs>